All right, we wait a couple seconds. They are still entering the room. All right. Good morning, uh, good day in some other places, and welcome to the 11th installment of the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies Virtual Forum. I am Alicia Shepard, and I will be your chair for today's proceedings. On Sunday, 25th of September this year, during an interview with CNN, Christian Amanpour, Inter uh, International Monetary Fund Chief uh, Kristalina Georgieva warned, mm -hmm. It is important to think that this compounded impact of multiple crises is already testing the patience and resilience of people. And if, and if you don't take action, she uh, said, to support the most vulnerable, there would be consequences. Despite her reference at the time to inflation, this statement is apt for today's session. As we take action by addressing one of the multiple crises increasingly testing the patience and resilience of our people in this region, gun-related violence. Today, we tackle this scourge by way of the moot, gun-related violence and criminal homicide in Caribbean societies, data-driven insights and expert reflections towards ameliorative action. To guide the discussion is an astute panel, Dr. Dr. Herbert Gale, Professor Charles Katz, Dr. Erica Adams, Dr. Jeffrey St. Bernard, Dr. Wayne Pitts, Dr. Wendell Wallace, and Dr. Elizabeth Ward. Each promised to ignite a unique perspective on the issue. As was the case in, pre in previous fora, the session will take the format of 10 minutes individual presentations prepared by each panelist. After all presentations are completed, we move to the panel discussion during which the audience will be invited to join the conversation by way of questions, comments, for the panel to simply offer up, or, or rather uh, individuals can simply offer up new insights or perspectives. We will then close the curtain uh, on the event with a vote of thanks by Ms. Cheryl Floyd, followed by a brief uh, closing remarks by yours truly. So without further ado, I now invite Dr. Sin Bernard, Acting Director of Salisas, to present the official opening remarks. Dr. Bernard. Good morning, everyone. And it gives me great pleasure this morning to welcome each and every one of you, our esteemed panelists, and of course, our virtual audience. I think I should also say good afternoon, dependent on where some people are located. So good morning, good afternoon to all of you. As our chair indicated, this is the 11th in our series of the Salises Virtual Seminar Series. And we are very pleased to be associated with this event over the past year. And I say this because if you know what Salises, the Sarta Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies is about, we are really about you know, promoting and supporting development agendas by virtue of our research, by virtue of our training, and by virtue of our advocacy and consultancy efforts, outreach, et cetera. So this fits aptly into our activities. And I think you know, this particular forum, which is going to be focused on gun violence, and how it impacts criminal homicide and what we should do to treat with it, it is very important and very relevant and pertinent at this point in time. So I think this forum is a very timely one and I'm pleased that Salises can actually be the harbinger that brings this for forum into light. And I say this because I, uh, living in Trinidad and Tobago and um, looking at the situation with respect to violent crime, of course, violent crime precipitated by guns, it, it, it's really troubling for the citizenry. And I think, you know, quite apart from all of the commentaries that come from laypersons, law enforcement authorities, um, the court system, and others, the academic community and the scholars um, have not been heard as much. And there's a lot going on out there with respect to um, criminal activities 
as they relate to gun violence and, and homicide in particular. And I think, you know, it was really important for Salises in its virtual seminar series to mount this particular forum that treats frontally with the issue. And we felt it important not only to have local academics and scholars who have done some work on the issue, but we felt it important also to ensure that our scholarly colleagues who hail from overseas, in this case, we have three scholars from the United States, Dr. Pitts, Professor Katz, and Dr. Adams. I want to thank the three of you for graciously agreeing to participate in today's forum. And from the Caribbean region, we have Dr. Ward and Dr. Gill from Jamaica, and I want to thank them personally. They are two really dear colleagues of mine, and I want to thank them personally for agreeing to participate. And here in Trinidad and Tobago, yours truly, and Dr. Wallace, Wendell Wallace, will be saying a few things to our participants. So I'm pleased to have such an esteemed group of scholars participating in today's event. And I'm sure it's going to be a feast for those of you who would witness the deliberations as we proceed with the discussions. So it's my pleasure to really have Salises taking charge and leading this effort. And I'm sure all of our participants in the virtual audience and elsewhere will really have good things to say about what we are doing. Clearly, this is a critical issue that we need to embrace and to, to, to interrogate and, and to find solutions. And I'm hoping that coming out of today's discussions, there could be some interesting leads and it is going to be clear that you know the academic community does have something to say with regard to addressing the scourge that has plagued um, the region for the for all of the millennium thus far. And it seems from all appearances that there isn't much that has been done so far that can bring an end to it. So we are hoping that our discussions will help in that regard. I want to make one statement about you know, a new book that has been um, edited by Dr. Wendell Wallace. I think it is an apt um, book in terms of treating with these issues, uh, looking at gun violence and issues related to gun violence in the global south. I think you, know, you should... Um, be aware that the book is out and go try to obtain a copy of it just in case you were not aware of it. So Dr. Wendell Wallace's book, um, I will share with you the title as the proceedings uh, evolve, but certainly it is a book that will assist in helping us to treat with some of the problems, not only in Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean, but also in the global south. And I can assure you that others such as Dr. Um, Randy C. Passad, uh, um, Professor Katz in particular, have also done a tremendous amount of work on issues in the region. And you should be aware of their works as well. And I'm saying this because we have this forum because I'm somewhat convinced that not enough is done with respect to infusing the, 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 the culture of research as espoused by academics and colleagues. I don't think sufficient is there's enough um, attention being placed on what comes out of the scholarly literature and how that can dovetail into helping us solve our problems. So having said that, and without um, a desire to monopolize the time, I just want to make one last announcement, and it is indeed a sad announcement for the Salises family, because just last week we lost one of our dear colleagues who has taught in our program. His name is Ms. Mr. Dave Clement. He died tragically on the weekend, and um, it has really rocked me in a serious way because I have known Dave for almost 50 years. 
and he is a committed soldier in terms of you know his support for any matter relating to official statistics and statistics for development he's a fierce crusader for statistics and we lost him and it has really affected me seriously uh, I'm not, uh, so I, I'm, I'm lost for words so i just want on behalf of salisis the salisis family on behalf of the university of the west indies regionally not only in trinidad and tobago and on behalf of all who are associated with the salisis forums and i would dare mention jacobs the journal of the Journal of the Caribbean Association of Professional Statisticians and the community of statisticians across the Caribbean region and elsewhere. I want, you know, on behalf of all of these groups to um, express our deepest condolences to his loved ones, his family members, and all of his friends and, 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 and dear friends and colleagues. We, 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 we just want to express our deepest condolences on his passing. So having said that, you know, I think I have said my bit in terms of opening this forum. And I want to thank all and sundry for their participation and hope that you will enjoy the proceedings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, St. Bernard. You have indeed um, delivered the worst set of um, information that I could have heard this morning. I, uh, Dr. Um, Mr. Clement was one of my lecturers during the program. So that has really um, struck home. Uh, condolences again to echo Dr. St. Bernard's co um, comments. Um, condolences to his family and friends. Um, unfortunately, we have to move on with the program. Um, so I would like to just make one correction. Uh, to the, today's forum is the 12th virtual forum instead of the 11th. So let's be reminded as we move ahead. We now move to the presentations by the panel. As was previously indicated, each speaker is allotted 10 minutes and will be given a prompt at the end of seven minutes. Speakers are encouraged to stay within the time frame and to mute and unmute your mics when necessary. All questions asked by members of the audience will be addressed during the panel discussion segment. However, questions, comments can be placed in the chat during the course of the presentations. Please be brief and if necessary, identify the panelists to whom the question is directed. However, all panelists can feel free to make a contribution to any question on the floor. Now, to set the stage for our discussion is our first panelist. Dr. Herbert Samuel Gale. Dr. Gale is a senior lecturer and head of the Department of Sociology, Psychology and Social Work at the University of the West Indies, Mona, in Mona, Jamaica. As a social anthropologist, he specializes in social violence and as an expert methodologist, he is versed in the four popular research methodologies, qualitative, quantitative, mixed methods and participatory and action research. Over the last 28 years, Dr. Gale has focused his research work on youth gangs and transnational criminal organizations within countries across five continents. Specific to the Caribbean, his work has impacted policies on the reduction of social violence. In Jamaica, Dr. Gale has contributed to the reduction of the number of violent actors deported to the island and has been successful in securing international development funding for some of the most vulnerable subpopulations in the country. His advocacy work in youth and violence prevention has been heard on several platforms in over 50 countries. His other areas of, of, of advocacy also include Black Gender Partnership and Women in Politics. His research portfolio boasts over 70 major works, including books, chapters, and articles, amongst which his most recent work, Males and Tertiary Education in Jamaica. Dr. Gale sits on several commissions task forces and advisory councils aimed at development in Jamaica and the Caribbean. Currently, he's the chairman of Fathers Incorporated and of the Children First Agency. Today, Dr. Gale brings us gun violence and gun homicide in Caribbean societies, an anthropological perspective. 
Dr. Gail, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just say good morning and uh, let me share with you uh, a presentation I want us to just reflect on uh, very quickly. All right, so today I want us to look at ontological security, class, gender, and gun violence in Jamaica. And uh, it's an area that many persons I have found, uh, regrettably, uh, simply haven't paid attention to. Uh, Jamaica uh, is, of course, located in the LAC, Latin America and the Caribbean. And for those who, who don't know this area, it's the colonized area of the world uh, that was once called a new world. And if you notice, the LAC accounts for 9.5% of the world's population, but literally 40% of its homicide. Now, Kingston and St. James are the epicenters of combatants' body count exceeding Iraq at full-scale war. And I'll show you these figures very quickly. On average, since the year 2000, Jamaica is, has been the fourth most violent place on earth. And it was number one again for the second time in 2021. And guns account for three quarters of homicide as the most effective tool. My position is simply that young men kill each other because they lack ontological security. It may seem simplistic, but if we go back to the work of Giddens, Anthony Giddens, and look at this idea of a mental state, we'll be able to understand uh, how young men who have very little or no sense of tomorrow can harm themselves and harm others. So there, there is the average since the year 2000 for the region. We're looking at the most violent countries in the world. And Jamaica, you will notice, is ranked fourth, Trinidad and Belize at the end of this chart. And if you're looking at, the, at Jamaica, those are the two hubs, Kingston in brown and Kingston in blue and Montego Bay, St. James in brown. If you look at the attempt of the government of Jamaica since the year uh, 1960, you will see something that helps you to understand and that our homicide problem are related to governance. Uh, in, in 1962 at Independence, the homicide rate was 4.15. You will see in 1980, Jamaica's civil war that people still refuse to declare a civil war, but of course, if you're trained in violence, you won't have a debate on that. And then again, again it keeps going up. And each time, each time the murder, the murders go up, the country creates a strike in '74, and the murders have continued to go on until it's heading back into '50 now for 2021. If you look at who dies in Jamaica, it is the data are very contrary to funding and very contrary to what people in the North often think and, and suggest in their work. You'll notice that men account for 80% of all deaths and they do account for more than 80% of all uh, murders. And boys are the, form the second largest group, 9.1%. Then it's followed by women, uh, and then men, and then girls. And I'll help you understand some things very quickly. If you, this is a study done, sponsored by a group of British women, uh, done in Jamaica by my team. And the first thing you'll discover is if you add this up, is that 64% of all women who die in Jamaica, and I can give the figures for Belize, it's 58%, uh, so it's still very close. We result of gang, 21% IPV, and quite often we spend all the Jamaica. If you look very quickly at Jamaica's transition in education, you'll see 1970 that only 64 women were in university compared to 100 men. Today it's 228%. 
And if you look very, very close in Jamaica, started for, for white boys only. Look at the girl's side, you'll see it's blank. And then it's the second phase, they build schools, white boys and white girls, after the protest by the nuns. And that is after slavery. And then the fracture of the British Empire started. And then they, they, they discovered that there was a shortage of labor on the plantation and they built schools basically for girls. They stopped building schools for boys. Those schools were built by Black Baptists in Jamaica. And so, and so as you look at that, it begins to make sense to you. What's happening as, as at SOAS, School of Oriental and African Studies, my team there start working on what creates ontological security. We were given the task by our professor and we started interviewing young people across, across the world uh, because that's the kind of school SOAS is. And we covered 117 countries and we found that there were four things that provide young people with ontological security, food, a sense of safety, a support system, and opportunity structures, meaning a sense of tomorrow or education. And if you look at Jamaica's survey of living condition, you'll see boys are 2.7 times more likely to be underweight. And you can look at all the data on Jamaica and some of it in, in aspects of Trinidad and all of Belize, you see the very same thing. So we created five groups and, and then we ran across to see what the index would look like. Shielded boys would be those uh, that, of course, uh, are shielded. Low would be those who are exposed to violence, but the family would protect them. Medium are those who have harmed somebody by stabbing or shooting, but never killing anyone. And high means they've killed once, and shutters mean they've killed more than once. If you look at those and you look at hunger alone, you'll see there's a direct correlation. And then if you look at father presence, one of the things you'll see, and mother presence, you'll see very quickly, is that while the national figures for, for, for fathers are 42%, in the inner city, it drops to 21%. And among boys who've killed, it, it drops further. But the the, the disaster for boys who happen to be absent mother. We have 68 women in our data set who've killed people. And in almost all cases, they have father disasters, similar to the boys who have mother disasters in terms of relationships. So if you look at our index that we've created, you'll see that if a boy is shielded, he has a 77% chance of making it to school. Uh, and during university, doing well, or have, in other words, 76% of the times, shutters in Jamaica will not make it to age 35. So if we should search for a super variable that, that does help us to understand the other variables. It would be how much time and money is spent on educating a child. If a boy drops out of grade nine, we use that as our baseline. And if he completes We seem to be having some technical issues with uh, Dr. Uh Secondary school and said at least three CXCs. What we found is that he was four times, four times. Can you hear me? Yes, doctor. Yes, but you're going in and out. I think it's your okay. internet connection that. Right, is... we've we've had a lot of rain here. I'm sorry. So. All right. I hope you can. I hope you can hear me. Right. So let me let me go again. I'm saying using grade nine as the baseline, and we've used that because it has been an elementary baseline in this country and in the region for a very long time. We've discovered that if a boy or a child completes, uh, specifically a boy, uh, CXCs, and he does actually three, which means he had enough support to be able to have the confidence to do three, he'd be four times less likely to be high risk. If he completed CAPE, he would be 10 times safer. And if he enrolled in college, even teacher's college, or U, U, UII or any other university, he'd be 85 times less likely to be involved in crime. Now. By running the index, we, it became very clear to us that education is an indicator or proxy for how much investment is made in young people in Jamaica. But if you look at the school system in Jamaica, 
an apartheid system immediately emerges. So we're looking at the all-girls schools in Jamaica. 15 of them were built by the churches and the state, but seven all-boys schools. And if you look at the, the grades, these are grades, as in those who qualify for university, you see 89 for girls uh, who attend these elite schools, 69 for boys, 61% for those who attend uh, uh, co-ed traditional, and all traditional is 73%. The technical schools in Jamaica, only 17% of these children within three years will qualify for a higher institution. And if they go to the new secondary schools, which is the bulk of schools built by the government of Jamaica itself, you will see that there are only 10. But we can break this down further. And then this is where the disaster hits. This is where it becomes clear, absolutely too clear, that a lot of our suppression policies make no sense in reducing gun violence in Jamaica. Are you uh, upper middle class, suburban, female? This is, so we're now adding a set of categorical variables where people live, their income, so class, and of course their gender. If an upper middle class, so an upper middle class, suburban, sorry. Dwelling, female. Sorry to, sorry, sorry to cut you. Um, we'll have one minute left just to wrap up a bit. First. Yes, I'm at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. So if, uh, if a girl lives in an in an upper middle class suburban area and she attends an all girls school, she will have a 99% chance. And that takes you all the way down to an inner city male who literally has a 3% chance of progressing. Now, if you look at the, the, the top 10 most violent communities in Jamaica, you will see a very frightening homicide rates. These are rates per 100,000, right? Remember that Iraq at full-scale war would have been 205 per 100,000. All of these, these, these communities exceed that. And I close by pointing out something to you. By, by looking at police data, it became clear. Only 24% of all murders, shootings, and breaches of the Firearms Act from 2016 to last year, 2021, were committed by anybody at all who had even basic training. The core of this is ontological security is hinged on training. And for all Caribbean states and LAC states that invest very little in any particular group of humans in this space, they will be assisting in fueling gun violence in the region. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gale. Uh, uh, frightening reality there, Dr. Gale. So we have to press on for, um, because of time. Uh, I want to remind speakers to kindly stay within the time frame and look at your chat. I will be sending you at the seven minute mark uh, a message concerning three minutes. Our next speaker is Dr. is Professor Charles Katz. Professor Charles Katz is the, is the Watts Endowed Family Chair of the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice. He's also Director of the Center for Violence Prevention and Community Safety. His work focuses on police trans transformation and strategic responses to crime. He regularly collaborates with international organizations to develop comprehensive strategic plans to diagnose and respond to problems related to crime and to violence. Today, Professor Katz will speak to us on risk factors associated with gun possession among youth, among school youths. Dr. Katz. Great. Well, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to, uh, or for inviting me to the uh, session today. I really appreciate it. Um, oops, have the wrong, uh, wrong time. I was even warned about this. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much for, for inviting me. Uh, I thought what I would do today is chat a little bit about uh, um, uh, guns, and I know that originally we were we were talking a little bit about guns and homicide, but I thought since I was at the front of the program today, I would try to set the stage for why there are an abundance of of guns in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, it, to make a to make a, a long story short, my work in Trinidad and Tobago started in the early 2000s uh, and continued through about 2010, and then has occurred periodically um, uh, here and there after that. But as we started to do some work in about 2004, 2005, 
uh, approaching into 2007, 2008, we started to follow homicide trends um, in Trinidad. And what we noticed was that around 2000, we started to see a massive departure in terms of homicide rates. Um, homicides have been, uh, before, prior to, to 2000, they were relatively flat. But in 2000, we saw an explosion in homicides. We started to look at, with the help of the TTPS, we started to look at uh, which aspects of homicides were starting to change at around 2000. Um, you know, there can be a lot of reasons. We can have proximate causes, some things that are near term. We can have root causes that might have been taking place um, for decades and are just starting to emerge. But what we saw in Trinidad was in 2000, it was an abrupt and real change where it, it literally just took off. It was this vertical um, uh, diagonal that took off in terms of homicides. And when we broke it down by weapon type, what we found was that strangulations held steady, uh, uh, homicides by a sharp instrument such as a cutlass held steady, but what was almost solely attributable to the increase in homicides was uh, homicides with a firearm. And that led us to start to start to recognize that the changes weren't changes that took place in education, weren't changes that took place in family, uh, but really what we started to see were a change in market factors with the availability of firearms, or at least the use of firearms and homicides. And, and because of that, I've always been curious about what firearm usage, uh, firearm prevalence rates look like in gun carrying, but not necessarily just among the, the among adults. And, and we've published some work on adults, especially among arrestees in gun carrying and gun, uh, gun acquisition rates. But as I was looking through some of my prior work, I realized that we had never actually published some work on gun carrying among youth. Uh, and we had carried out a little bit of analysis and we finished it up for, for this. And um, what I wanted to present to you today was really what gun possession looks like among youth. We, we know that when, 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 when youth, it becomes normative to carry weapons, when it becomes normative to carry a gun, we'll start to see gun carrying continue on uh, for a period of time, especially into ages when violence is much more likely to take place. So the presentation I have for you is going to be quick. Uh, it's going to be brief. Anybody uh, who needs copies of the slides afterward, I'm more than glad to share these with you. Uh, but what I really wanted to do was look at uh, three issues. And I'm going to put it in a comparative context that may not be fair, but nevertheless, I'm going to do that. Uh, but I want to look at three issues or provide information on three issues with you. Prevalence of, of gun possession among school-aged youth in Trinidad, ease of access to guns, and risk and protective factors associated with gun possession. Okay, and I'm going to do that with within the context of, of two pieces of, of research that, that I've carried out. One was through the Trinidad and Tobago Youth Survey, where we surveyed about 2,000 kids in forms uh, three and five in 25 schools. And then also uh, a fairly similar survey that was using almost an identical instrument uh, that we use here in Arizona uh, among youth about the same age, but it was a much larger sample. The reason why I wanted to compare it to Arizona in this case is, while many of you may not be familiar with it, with the exception of maybe, maybe Wayne, uh, Arizona is a very unique state in terms of gun culture. Arizona is an open carry state. You do not need a license to carry a gun in Arizona. You can get a gun however you <laughs> desire. Basically, it's, it's pretty much open. And you will go to stores here in Arizona. You will see people carrying firearms on their, on their side. Um, you don't need a license to have a handgun. Uh, they're very available. We have entire festivals that are surrounded where people can look at guns, buy guns, uh, no background check is required. It's very open. So I thought that it might be interesting for the purposes of, of this presentation to compare youth in Trinidad to those in Arizona, where it's pretty much just open, right? It, it, it's what a, a, in some nations might consider a worst case scenario as far as the gun culture looks like. With that said, I wanna warn you that our samples are not identical. Uh, for this, I did not have time to go back and reweight 
uh, our data um, in the United States, our data is slightly younger. In Trinidad, you'll notice that uh, the youth of, of most of the kids hover between 14 and uh, 16 years old, uh, and it's slightly younger in Arizona. Uh, we also have more kids uh, in Trinidad that go to school as females. Males are much more likely to either uh, uh, not attend school on that day or drop out of school compared to the states where mandatory education is, is treated a little bit differently. Uh, but the, the samples are different, but nevertheless, I think they're similar enough for us to get some decent comparisons here. Uh, I'm going to move through this very carefully because I think the, the findings are going to speak for themselves and then we'll move into it. And then later on today, we're going to have some time for, for some Q&A. But in, in terms of, of attitudes towards guns and gun carrying, what you can see is that, that rates of gun carrying among youth are fairly similar between Trinidad and I, what I say USA, that was just a smaller cell size. I mean by that Arizona. Um, what we're what we're able to do is is see that that uh, they're fairly similar, a little bit more in the U.S. We do see that kids in Trinidad are more likely to take a gun, albeit that rate is still fairly low at two percent. Uh, but we do see that friends who carry guns are fairly are fairly high. Uh, but where we really see some differences are that uh, guns are viewed as is cool to carry in Trinidad at more than twice the rate. So in other words, we see a culture that is that is very different in the US when compared to that, I'm sorry, in Trinidad when compared to the US where they're even more gun, gun carrying is uh, uh, roughly equal. We do see that it's treated a little bit different in the minds of youth. Uh, it's also much easier to carry or to uh, uh, get a handgun in Trinidad and the youth believe that they're much less likely to be caught by the police and the public. Now, I did run a number of, of uh, logistic regressions comparing Arizona to the United States, and I'm gonna boil it down to just one graph in a second, but I wanted to let you know what you were gonna get. We looked at a whole host of risk pack factors and protective factors associated with ease of obtaining a gun. You can see here community level factors, school level factors, family level factors, uh, peer and individual factors are important uh, to look at these issues, whether it be an ease in obtaining a gun or whether it be carrying a handgun. But the findings really come down to a few uh, factors. One is we know that youth who have a higher number of risk factors, if, they're at, if they have 17 or more risk factors, uh, meaning that they are at high risk for a variety of activities, we can see that the odds of them believing that it's easy to obtain a gun uh, go up astronomically, right? We really see that in terms of gun carrying by country. You can see that those who are at elevated risk, those who are at risk for 17 or more, uh, the odds of them carrying a gun are at about 151 uh, times uh, odds or ratio greater than that in the United States. And so this is sort of the slide that I really wanted to yeah. think get to, thank you, uh, is that guns are seen as cool. There is modest concern for the police identifying respond uh, for identifying youth for carrying a gun. Uh, gun possession is associated with uh, community, family, and early involvement in drug use. Uh, and ease of obtaining a handgun is associated with a whole host of risk factors that we can, in fact, predict. This is a preventable uh, problem. We can identify youth who are at higher risk for gun carrying, and we can uh, bring them into prevention and intervention program programming to reduce risk for gun carrying. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Katz, for bringing those realities uh, concerning the island of Trinidad and Tobago. As we make our way to the next speaker, um, we just want, would like to remind uh, our speakers to kindly check the chat for just your prompt, your seven minute prompt, and to remember to mute your mic for those who are not um, speaking at the point in time. All right, our next speaker uh, is Dr. Erica B. Adams. Dr. Adams is an associate professor in the Department of Justice Studies at San Jose State University. Her published works in the area of crime and deviance in Trinidad and Tobago crime control strategies implemented within underprivileged neighborhoods, as well as female substance abuse. Her current research interest centers on the impact of violence on communities in Trinidad and Tobago. The exclusionary practices that accompany a criminal record 
and whether criminal expungement transforms the lives of those who have been previously convicted of criminal offenses. Dr. Adams currently serves as the co-chair of the Division on People of Color and Crime of the American Society, Society of Criminology. Dr. Adams frames her discussion as the lure of the gangs, gun violence and gun homicide in Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Adams. Thank you. And good morning to everyone. I'd like to start by saying thank you to Dr. St. Bernard for this invitation to speak today. And the papers that I'll be presenting were written in collaboration with Dr. Ed McGuire and Dr. Patrice Morris. So I'll just go over a brief introduction, methodology, results from the study, and a conclusion. So research shows that gang violence in the Port of Spain area poses significant problems to communities and the nation as a whole. Between 2000 and 2009, gang-related murders increased by 971% in the nation. And from 2010 to 2015, the mean annual homicide rate in the Port of Spain area was about 137.6 per 100,000. If we look at some of the risk factors for gang involvement, we see things like residential mobility, low commitment to school, and access to handguns in a young person's area. Gang members are involved in various criminal offenses, including murder, kidnapping for ransom, drug trafficking, prostitution, and the trafficking of human beings. And today, I'll really be exploring a few factors that attract young people to gangs. So a little bit about the data that we collected. So the qualitative data that I'll be speaking about today was collected as part of an evaluation of Project Reason, which is a local adaptation of Cure Violence. And Cure Violence is a community-based public health initiative that's really designed to address the prevalence of gun violence in high crime communities. Project Reason was operational in 16 communities in and around the Port of Spain area from 2015 to 2017. The research team for this project consisted of nine people and three people collected the qualitative data that I'll be speaking about today. In terms of our qualitative data, we did 37 semi-structured interviews and two focus groups. We interviewed employees from Project Reason, young men who had current and former gang affiliations. We also spoke to influential members of the community, residents who were impacted by gun violence and gang violence, and police officers who were assigned to these neighborhoods. The research was IRB approved and all participants were over the age of 18 and provided informed consent. So just a brief overview of the results that I'll be talking about. I'll go over briefly borderline issues, employment opportunities, contractual work, and what Project Reason has started doing to intervene in some of the gang violence. So what we noticed was that there were several invisible boundaries between some of the gang territories in the Port of Spain area. So something as simple as a street or drain could actually serve as a borderline that young men in one community could not cross because the other area is controlled by a street gang that's in a rivalry with a gang that controls their area. So entering the wrong community actually proved deadly to some some young people, and I'll include some quotes throughout the presentation. So one of our interviewees noted that one youth got 18 bullets. He used to live in Muslim city and his mother moved to Rasta city. The young man still had friends in Muslim city and he wanted to go visit them. When he was going back into Muslim city to see his friends, he was shot and killed. So young, some young people actually reported that they were afraid to pass through areas that were controlled by other street gangs. And so some people dropped out of school and others were hesitant to look for employment in uh, um, other communities because they didn't wanna pass through some areas. 
the communities that we did the study in in Port of Spain are well known throughout Trinidad and Tobago for their high crime rates. And one of the consequences of this notoriety is diminished opportunities for employment for some of the residents who live in the neighborhood. Residents noted that they encountered a lot of stigma when looking for work. One person said the area is stigmatized. When you are going for an interview, you have to change your address. If the employer sees you are from this area, you will not get hired. They will tell you, thank you, we will be in touch. As soon as you put another address, you get hired. The people in this area feel very, are very angry due to the lack of opportunities they have. So some people who live in these neighborhoods, they, feel, they felt constrained by the limited legitimate opportunities that they had to earn money. And some of them actually started relying on gangs for the provision of food, clothing, and jobs. Now, residents are acutely aware of the fact that gangs attract a lot of violence to their neighborhoods, but then they still need, feel the need to rely on them for support. So one of the interviewees said, the gangs bring a lot of violence to their communities and this violence makes other people in the country shun them, but they, community members, then have to rely on the same gang members for help. So what we saw was sort of a vicious cycle, right, of gangs attracting a lot of uh, violence to communities, of residents within these communities and encountering limited opportunities due to the stigmatization of their neighborhoods, but then also relying on these gangs for support. And one of the employment opportunities that residents received from gangs was contractual work. And so contractual work through the Unemployment Relief Program, CPEP, and construction contracts were a primary strategy for um, gangs to earn money. And so in low income and high crime communities, some of these public works contracts were awarded to gang leaders who then hired and distributed payment to community members. Um, some community members noted that the contracts were a prime source of income for them, and they actually relied on it for economic survival. So one interviewee said, we have no jobs in the area. We feed the community through URP jobs, and some people have CPEP work. So, so far, we've seen that the high amount of gang violence in these communities uh, limit residents' opportunities, right? And uh, the gang wars uh, actually attract uh, um, the sense that these communities, people should stay away from individuals within these communities because, uh, because of the, the level of violence. So the last theme that I would like to speak about was something that uh, Project Reason actually started doing to try to decrease uh, the level of violence within some of these communities. And so Project Reason employees actually worked to try to intervene in some of the murders that they learned were being planned. So upon learning of a homicide that was being planned, the employees in the in the this project would actually go to the potential offender and try to dissuade them from engaging in the offense. So one of the employees explained a situation where this happened. They said there was a case with Brent in Hummingbird Road. He was into music, working, and a very respectable young man in his community. A person who was not so upstanding was spotted in front of Brent's building. Someone made a call to have that person killed. By the time the gunman came, the person he was supposed to shoot was gone, and Brent was standing in front of the building. The gunman accidentally killed Brent. We had to sit on or stay with the older brother for four days straight because he was very disturbed. We cooked food for him and made sure no one went to do any reprisals. So sometimes these strategies that uh, project reason employees implemented were successful. Sometimes they were able to intervene in the violence and stop uh, the, the homicide, but sometimes they weren't, right? Uh, because uh, for whatever reason, the person who was planning the incident, they were really committed to do it. So in those uh, instances, uh, they would try to get the potential victim out of the area. They would try to use other strategies to keep uh, people safe. Um, so in a, a conclusion, uh, we see that various factors uh, attract a lot of people um, to 
become involved in gangs. We see that borderline issues that limit young men's movements, employment opportunities that are limited within the area, employers' reluctance to hire people from stigmatized communities, but also gang leaders' ability to provide short-term employment to residents through contracts. So what is to be done? It's really important that the strategies to combat gang involvement be multifaceted and really tailored to, to the communities that are impacted by gang violence. And so based on these findings, some of the things that we could start thinking about uh, uh, would be suppressing gang wars that lead to borderline issues, um, encouraging employers to hire residents from stigmatized communities, and also uh, trying to allocate uh, contractual jobs to members in high crime communities in a way that does not involve uh, street gangs. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Erica, for bringing insight into some causal factors for the crimes uh, with gun violence, associated with gun violence we see in Trinidad. We really appreciate it. Uh, we notice your windedness. Um, sorry for the 10 minutes, guys. I, I know it's <laughs> it seemed to be a race. As we move forward with today's proceedings, we would like to now open the floor to Dr. Uh, Godfrey St. Bernard. Um, Godfrey, Dr. Godfrey St. Bernard is a senior lecturer and acting director of the Sir Arthur Lewis um, Institute of Social and Economic Studies, the UE St. Augustine chapter. Prior to this post, uh, Dr. St. Bernard worked as a statistician in the Central Statistical Office in Trinidad and Tobago, responsible for the production of social and vital statistics. As a social demographer, his academic interests include problems akin to population and development, applied statistical analysis, research methodology, evaluation research, and social policy. He has authored numerous scholarly articles, uh, studies rather, including books, chapters, and articles appearing in peer-reviewed journals. Currently, his research interests include children and youth, violence prevention and safety promotion, the measurement of social phenomenon, and, and population policy and dynamics in Circum Caribbean. He is also the project lead on two international projects, the Rise for Children and Youths Partnership Project and the Computation of a Comprehensive Wealth for Trinidad and Tobago Project. He also continues to coordinate the MSc in Development Studies, a program he pioneered in 2008 at the Silesia St. Augustine. Today, Dr. St. Bernard will address trends and patterns, 20 years of gun, gun homicide in Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. St. Bernard. Okay, thank you very much, Chair, and I'm delighted to make this presentation. And if you look at the screen immediately, you would see some statistics on gun fatality, violent gun fatality rates in different countries. And I'm showing those countries with what you would consider to be relatively low gun fatality rates, and then those countries with very high gun fatality rates. And you can see the stark difference with respect to gun fatality in different countries across the world. Of course, where there's high gun fatality rates, it's largely Latin American and Caribbean countries. And of course, you can see Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, the Bahamas, Belize, Fiji, among the countries with high gun fatality rates, relatively speaking. And these are among the highest gun fatality rates in the world. Of course, mostly in Asian countries, you can see it's almost non-existent gun fatality based on the rates that are presented. And these rates are really computed for 100,000 of their respective populations. As we move forward, you can see annual homicide counts in Trinidad and Tobago dating back to 1960 up until 2019. And I have to say that this, I, I'm looking at the first 20 years of the, 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 the 21st century. And really and truly these data are obtained graciously from the Crime and Problem Analysis Unit, CAPA within the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. And I've been tracking these data and collecting these data over a number of years and doing a lot of interesting analyses with the data. And as you can see, even if we go back to 1960, Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago was already a violent society. 
I mean, we were talking about less than 100 murders um, between 1960 up until about the mid 80s thereabout. And clearly, I mean, the numbers you see there seem to suggest that, yeah, this is indeed a violent society, even from the word go in 1960. But as Professor Katz said, sometime around 2000 onward, there was that astronomical increase in, 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 in homicide counts. But that increase even started um, marginally um, as far back as the mid 80s. So from about 1985 onward, except for 1986 and 1990, they have the, the number of homicide counts have exceeded one 100. And what you are actually seeing there, as he alluded to, is the, the presence of guns and the use of guns featuring mainly in the kind of astronomical increase that took place. If you had if you look at some of the findings presented by Sutton and Alvarez in a 2017 study, what they speak about in the earlier period are really homicide that, that was due largely to sharp and blunt instruments as opposed to guns. But since the late 80s and ex especially through the 90s and even more so beyond 2000, guns have become the mainstay of homicide in Trinidad and Tobago. And you can see some of the figures here, because what I really want to do here is just to present the figures to give you a sense in terms of what is happening or what has been happening in Trinidad and Tobago. And from 2000 to 2019, you can see that the total number of homicide counts in, 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 in Trinidad and Tobago amounted to 7,580 thereabouts. Of that number, 5,657 were due specifically to the use of firearms, amounting to 74.6% of all homicide over that 20 year period being due to firearms. And you can see if when you look at the table and you look at the rightmost column, how gun use cases as a percent of all homicide cases, how the the, 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 the the proportion of such gun use cases have increased over the years relative to all homicide. In 2000, it was just about half of all cases, all homicide cases due to gun use, really and truly speaking. By the time we got to 2019, it's 80.5%. That's a phenomenal increase. And I would imagine given what has been happening since 2020 onward, you would even see greater increases in that proportion. Now, when you look at some of the um, main data that we have, of course, the vast majority of, uh, of, of the cases, whether we are talking about homicide or gun use, and since there's a strong correlation between the two, you'd find that it doesn't matter um, whether you're talking about all homicide or gun use homicide, that the pattern is the same in terms of how it's correlated with some of the key attributes. So obviously you would see that, you know, in, in terms of the proportion of homicides, um, in terms of probable cause, gang-related activities, revenge, drug-related activities, and to a somewhat lesser extent, all um, Robbery, uh, those are some of the main, 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 main factors associated with some of these outcomes. Of course, there are a number of unknown uh, cases where there's unknown cause, and this is primarily due to the high non-detection rate associated with homicide in Trinidad and Tobago. 79.9%, almost 80% of all homicide goes undetected where no one is charged and no one has a sense as to what might be the cause, so to speak. In the case of gun homicide, it is even more drastic in terms of almost 90% of gun homicide goes, go, go, goes um, undetected. And this has implications because it really means that, you know, there's something about that gun and carrying that gun that is even preventing witnesses from speaking out. And I think the authorities do have difficulty attracting witnesses to come forward and, 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 and declare what they would have seen or, or, or witnessed at the time of an event. In terms of some of the areas, certainly Port of Spain is a very small police division. 
but Port of Spain has the vast majority of cases, whether we are talking about homicide or gun, gun use homicide, I mean, Port of Spain has a vast majority of cases, followed by the Northern Division and the Northeastern Division, the Western Division. If you understand Trinidad and Tobago, most of these um, divisions are somewhat contiguous when compared with to Port of Spain, which is located on the tip of the, on, on the Northern Peninsula, so to speak. Of course, when you look at age, the vast majority, um, you're seeing more than 80%. If you look, yeah, where, where, where the cursor is, um, I'm not seeing the cursor, but anyway, more than 80% of cases are due to young persons who are either 18 to 29 years or 30 to 44 years. And men account for, um, men account for 95% of the gun use homicide and almost 90% of all homicide. So this gives you a quick sense in terms of what is going on. What I've done here is really try to look at the situation by taking into account ethnicity, gender, and, and, and ethnicity and gen ethnicity, gender, and age. And if you were to really look at individuals according to ethnicity, gender, and age, and look at a distribution according to those three characteristics coming together, what you will find again is you know all more than half of the, the the homicide cases at African males who are either 18 to 29 30 to 44 percent right African males who are either 20 and that's a large number compared to other males and even when you look at um, other males of course um those of East Indian descent, it's, it's somewhat much smaller and other males even much smaller. So again, what you are seeing, whether you are looking at all homicide cases or gun-related homicide, in the case of gun-related homicide, it's more than 60% of gun-related homicide directed to African males who are either 18 to 29 or 30 to 44. In the case of the former, it's 36.5%. In the case of the latter, it's 26.8%. When you look at other groups, it's less than, much less than 10% in, in a sense. So really and truly, uh, and I don't think you know this is saying anything that is much different from what perhaps we know, but it is providing further confirmation, nonetheless, that you know it is the African population and the African male population in particular that are the victims, and in particular, young African males that are the, 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 the focus of this thing. When you look at the situation for females, of course, it is almost um, non-existent and it's pretty much consistent with what we saw earlier when we looked at the situation with respect to females. Now, what this does, it looks at, you know, over the 20 year period, the trend in, in, in all homicide cases in the dark blue compared to the trend in gun use homicide in the gray. And what you actually see is that the gun use homicide is virtually mimicking the the, the, the all homicide. So it tells you something about, you know, since 2000, the extent to which, you know, all homicide cases are really influenced and, 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 and triggered by gun homicide cases. And it is becoming more apparent that that is the case as you delve deeper into the new millennium. Now, I have at the side Port of Spain Division, Northern Division, Northeastern Division, Western Division. If you were to generate this, what you see here is for Trinidad and Tobago, but if you were to generate the same chart for Dr. Each... Trinidad, I'm sorry to cut you. You have one minute. Okay, thank you. If you were to generate it for each of these divisions, you are going to find that there's virtually no gap between the gun homicide cases and the all homicide cases. Of course, in the other divisions, there is somewhat of a gap that you will see. And, but the gap actually closes as you get to about 2015 to 2020 there about, which says that you know the gun homicide in terms of its prevalence in all homicide cases is really picking up 
and it is cutting across all divisions of Trinidad and Tobago, especially as the new millennium advances. Um, in terms of closure, I did some logistic regressions here, and clearly when compared to, to all causes, of course, drug-related um, um, cases, gang-related causes, and revenge, those stand out as some of the main triggers for gun homicide when compared to other causes in terms of the police division. Um, Southwestern division is relatively low, but we see how all of the other divisions have significantly um, larger um, orientation toward gun, gun homicide when compared to the Southwestern division. The only difference is Tobago. And in terms of age, clearly what we saw in terms of the African male 18 to 29 and 30 to 44 stands out when compared to all other persons in all other age and sex groups and ethnic groups and so on. And clearly there is something happening across the years which would indicate that, you know, as the years go by, there is some significant increases in what's happening with respect to gun violence. So to tie up, of course, what this is saying, you know, um, gun violence, uh, to, to, to really reduce homicide, it's really about, you know, what are we going to do about reducing gun violence? I think, you know, there is something to be done in terms of the use of guns and, and the prevalence of guns. It's a derived demand. We have to understand this derived demand and how we can begin to reduce this derived demand. It has to be from the, de um, the derived demand side. Um, the other thing, of course, is in terms of databases, we think, you know, that CAPA can perhaps, why we are thankful for what they provide, they can do more in terms of, you know, working with the university to help de develop data systems and so on. Of course, there, there are opportunities for research collaborations between CAPA and the UWI and other um, such sources to facilitate and to, 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 to give some oomph, so to speak, to, you know, systematic research and critical research. Uh -huh. that, and finally, targeting, you know, young African males 18 to 29, 30 to 44 years. I think there is room for some work there as well, which I can develop in the discussion. So I'd like to thank you for um, the opportunity to present and we can discuss these matters further. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sim Bernard. What are we going to do to reduce gun violence? Yes, that is the, the question on the floor for everyone to discuss later. As we move on in our program, we have next on the agenda, Dr. Wayne Pitts. Dr. Wayne Pitts is a research criminologist in the, in, in the investigative program, part of the RTI International Applied Justice Research Division. Dr. Pitts, subsequent to this, to his post as a researcher, or prior to his post as a researcher, sorry, at the Institute for Social Research at the University of New Mexico, he became a professor in the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice of the University of Memphis, where he also directed the Mid-South Survey Research Center, founded the Caminos de, uh, de Rachos program to recruit and train bilingual justice professionals and continue to conduct policing and corrections research in Central America and the Caribbean. After joining RTI in 2012, several of his projects in Latin America has been funded by um, sorry, has been funded by several international organizations, including the Department of State Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement, the Organization of uh, American States, US Aid, and the US Department of Defense. He, is, he has served as principal investigator for the Lo Longitudinal Guatemala Deportation Study and is currently leading similar activities in Honduras. His domestic work since 2020 has focused on tasks related to National Forensic Laboratory Information Systems, funded by the US Drug Enforcement Administration. Dr. Pitt's research areas include uh, criminology, particularly in Latin America, transnational migration, deportation, program evaluation, human trafficking, and community trust and police legitimacy. 
Dr. Pitt speaks to us today about recent episodes of gun violence and gangs in Belize. Dr. Pitts. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today, and I want to especially thank the um, the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social Studies and Economic Studies and Dr. Bernard for inviting me to participate in this activity. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with um, others, other esteemed colleagues, some who I've never met in person, Dr. Gale, I'm very pleased to be here, Dr. Wallace, and of course, I know Dr. Katz uh, quite well. So it's a pleasure to be here. I wanted to say, say a couple of details about RTI International, just for those who may not know. It's Research Triangle Institute International. It's located, it's headquarters in uh, North Carolina in the US, um, with, but has offices all over the, all over the world. I'm very pleased uh, to come to you today from the Applied Justice Research uh, Division. Um, I'd like to introduce a bit also about how I came to be doing work in Belize. So back in 2018, there was an opportunity uh, through the U.S. Embassy in Belmopan uh, to apply to, uh, for some smaller research grants uh, to help promote civil society um, well, do capacity building for civil society organizations and civil servants agencies. As part of that, one a project that we proposed was to encourage these um, agencies to take advantage of open data sources. Um, oftentimes, you know, we wanted to, them to be able to add to the um, the rigor of their appeals to to their various legislative agencies uh, and to to produce products, communication products that were based in research. And so that was the foundation of this, of this project that was, was funded by the uh, Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement, part of the Department of State of the U.S. And so this project, um, we wanted to take a look at um, gun violence in general in Belize, and we used open source data to be able to produce this descriptive paper. Um, some, uh, some have described Belize as um, as a country uh, left behind in some cases as, as early as, uh, as 2019, only 10 years after independence, it was referred to by one author as an omitted land. Perhaps it's because of its relative small size, uh, uh, just under 400,000 people in the total population. Um, perhaps because there's only one university in the country that produces a, 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 or promotes a criminology, criminal justice type degree. Um, there seems to be a dearth of information about police, and so this paper and in, in the one uh, one prominent uh, object uh, um, um, evidence of, of research that's been done is Dr. Gale's work in 2010, and I was very happy to see that he's on this panel. Um, so here, uh, firearms are at the heart of much of Belize's violence and crime. Though firearm offenses come with strict penalties and can result in lengthy jail sentences, approximately two thirds of all homicides are committed using a gun. So, and, and many other violent crimes also involve the use of, of guns. Um, the widespread circulation of guns, both licit and illicit in Belize, is a growing concern, particularly, particularly because the types of firearms circulating are increasingly sophisticated and include military, military style weapons. As I'm quite sure that you're aware, no weapons are produced in Belize. So therefore, all weapons that, that um, end up in Belize come from other sources. In fact, the most, you know, and those usually include Brazil, Israel, the US, um, other, other places as well. But there is a widespread circulation of guns. While the government of Belize gun laws require a thorough background check, um, a waiting period of at least six months, controls for maximum caliber allowed, ammunition access, such measures do little to address illicit gun ownership. So in 2017, the last date in which I had uh, um, updated information regarding registered firearms, there were 10, just under 11,000 uh, citizens who had a registered legal firearm. However, the number of uh, illicit or unregistered firearms is probably somewhere around twice that amount, maybe three times that amount. Um, so the police department of Belize, or the Belize Police Department, as it should be called, has progressively increased its seizures of firearms and, and ammunition. Um, they still have um, some significant challenges. So some things that I wanted to mention, and someone asked about the determining of the root causes of, of violence in Belize, um, and gun violence specifically, the prevalence of firearms underscores 
the fact that exposure to guns, especially in urban regions, is part of negotiating and resolving conflicts in the community and inside the home. And this much of this, uh, in the, the foundation of what I'm saying now comes from Dr. Gale's previous work. Gains, drug, gangs, drugs, and black market activities are also important factors to consider. So since about 2002, and incidentally also about that time is when the uh, gun, gun violence began to increase, the homicide rate began to increase significantly around 2000, similar to that in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, gang violence has been on the rise since about 2002. The code of the street, the idea that uh, you know, reputation, saving face or paramount, paramount combined with um, easy firearm access leads to increased gang related murders. Within this scenario, um, guns are symbols of protection, status of promotion and, and promote a masculine identity. And of the annual deaths resulting from firearms between let's say 2007 and 2014, about 95% of the victims were male. That trend continues. Um, however, women are on the rise, girls and, and, and women are on the rise. And we've been seeing a consistent um, increase in the overall homicide rate of, against women since about 2011, rising from around five, uh, five, uh, five to, to, to about eight now. So it's, um, it is increasing for, for, for women. So um, that's some important details that I wanted to share related to that. So perhaps surprisingly, and I know that other countries within Central America, within the Caribbean, um, have uh, a Firearms Act. The Firearms Act of Belize is especially restrictive. Um, gun licenses have been legally required since 1987, um, but there have been a number of significant updates to that law uh, over in, in 2003, 2011, and the most recently in 2018. Um, under the current legislation, all assault rifles, machine guns, sawed off or otherwise modified weapons, and any kind of rifled long gun using ammunition larger than 7.62 millimeters are illegal. Shotguns have a, you know, a, a limitation on how long they can be, the barrels can be, and no handguns are allowed above a nine millimeter size. Moreover, the police commissioner makes a decision and reviews each one of these applications and can impose additional restrictions. For example, the number of, of, of um, ammunition that the person could have on hand. Um, they have certain other restrictions on uh, sound suppressors, extended magazines, um, any type of reloading equipment, um, unregistered bulletproof vest. I mean, the law is quite serious in Belize uh, regarding uh, gun ownership, yet, uh, there continue to be uh, an abundance of guns, and it would be an it would certainly be incorrect to say that there's a shortage of weapons. Um, most violations, uh, and, and here's a good example of that. So most violations of the Belize Firearm Act are punishable by a minimum at least two years in prison. And I happen to have a solid contact and be on long-term relationship with the uh, current warden of the um, Belize Central Prison and was talking to him recently about this. And he said, you know, fewer than 3% um, um, of the persons convicted and serving time uh, actually had a firearm offense as their most serious charge. So whereas you have this um, pretty significant uh, laws to prevent the use of illegal weapons and, and to involve in, in criminal behaviors with weapons, uh, the actual ev the evidence shows a far different, um, uh, far different story. So there are a few things that I want to um, highlight, and, and I, I should talk a bit about Belize. This is just from my perspective as working in the police area. Um, Belize is an incredibly difficult country to manage it's, from a police perspective. It has long uh, borders uh, and very difficult. The, the, the borders on the ocean are particularly difficult because of all the many coyotes that, are, that they have. You have Mexico to the north, Guatemala to the, to the west, and huge rural, uh, you know, vast areas of rural space that are un, unprotected and unable to be policed well. Um, Belize City has about 60,000 people and it is truly an urban urban environment. Um, Belmo Pond, the capital by contrast is less than 20,000 people. So those are the two largest populations within the country. And um, so again, I would emphasize how difficult it is the rural policing sections to involve that. So I have a number of ideas and things that could be used to reduce fire and violence in Belize. Uh, number one, I think there's a, a definite need to strengthen social intervention programs, especially in urban areas. 
uh, creating opportunities for youth, um, workforce development, um, balanced pre pro pre prevention programming needs to become a greater priority and implementers should in introduce strategies to reduce stigma affecting participation. This goes back to the culture of masculinization. Um, that people just don't want to take part in these programs, and especially the males. Which are, yes. Okay, I'll, I'll move forward. Um, th those violence prevention programs. Um, I think it's also important that we address, um, you know, the gaps within the police police department who are, are both must be both well trained and equipped to respond to suspected gun crimes, proactive approaches um, to prevent gun ownership in Belize be begins with enforcing regulatory and criminal enforcement of ownership and sales. So the enforcement of the laws that already exist are, are critically important. Um, also, should we should look at um, these uh, approaches to gun violence prevention strategies that must be community informed place-based, person-driven um, deterrence strategies. And I think focused deterrence um, opportunities have, um, have promise in Belize and something that we should strongly consider. I also would like to address that many of the crimes that are occurring with guns occur during school hours by juveniles. So we need to address issues of, of school truancy in, in Belize. Um, it's a you know, compulsory education participation must be encouraged and vocational program grounded in measured labor market needs uh, should be promoted. Finally, civil society organizations, and this is where this project began, have a role to play in bringing these issues to the forefront of the political discussion and the political narrative. This is something that must, must include um, you know, gun violence prevention plans with key stakeholders involved, including youth, women, community organizers, faith leaders, public officials, law enforcement, researchers, international donors, or donors Etc. And we definitely need to take into account the gendered based differences between gun violence and Belize because it's such an important detail. And I will stop there. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pitts, and quite an interesting um, perspective on Belize, I must add. We are a little behind time, but we will. We'll move ahead with the last presentation. As a matter of fact, um, our presenter is not in the studio today, but she has left her, um, her presentation, Dr. Elizabeth Ward. Uh, just to give you a little insight on the work of uh, Dr. Elizabeth Ward, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Ward has a background working in public health prevention services planning implementing, managing, and evaluating large-scale public health programs. She has worked as a Director of Disease Prevention and Control of Health Promotion and Protection Division in the Ministry of Health in Jamaica. Dr. Ward uh, spearheaded the development of the Jamaica Inquiry Surveillance System that tracks hospital-based inquiries, which are in turn linked to crime and social data used in crime observatory work and in the Integrated Crime and Violence Information System at the Ministry of National Security on the island. In 2004, her work led to the establishment of the Violence Prevention Alliance Jamaican Chapter, a think tank for solutions to the problem of violence. Her recent work at the Institute of Criminal Justice and Security focused on youth violence and organized crime in Jamaica, causes and countermeasures, and on crime and violence prevention planning. Her other works include contribution to the consensus of crime uh, in 2020, National Plan of Action for an Integrated Response to Children and Violence, uh, Dr. Dr. Ward has also collaborated with several international organizations, including her service as a commissioner on Early Childhood Commission, and, the now, and she's also the now chair of um, the, sorry, now chair of the Violence Prevention Alliance, where she continues to work towards uh, reducing the levels of violence and build, and to build safety communities. Dr. Ward is so unfortunately, again, unable to be with us, but her presentation is entitled The Impact of Trauma on the Brain and Gun-Related Violence and Criminal Homicide in Caribbean Societies. We will now listen to the recording sent by uh, Dr. Ward. Over to you, uh, Josanne. Okay, today we're looking at the impact of trauma on the brain. 
this has really been made worse by the gun-related violence and criminal homicides that we're seeing in Caribbean societies, which have now become severely traumatized. To do something about this, we really have to understand what is the root cause. And we know that homicide is really a big problem across the region, um, with the Caribbean having twice the international average and one of the highest regional rates. Jamaica's homicide rate is 54 per 100,000. We know that the homicide rate increased by 5% in 2021. Violence is highly concentrated and early exposure leads and contributes severely to trauma. The drivers of the violence are diverse. We know about organized crime and gangs, and you'll be discussing this at length in this series. Social norms also support violence in many communities, and the lack of community and family protective factors has contributed to the increase in the homicidal rates. We know that violence, when it happens early against children, increases the rate of non-communicable diseases, the rates of risk behaviors, including alcohol and drug use. The whole problem of mental health, depression is four times as likely. Post-traumatic stress is often, suicide is 12 times as likely. And very important that the perpetration perpetration and becoming a victim of violence is seven times as high as it was. The impact of ACEs on diseases show that children having four or more of these adverse experiences are going to have the incre these kind of increases in the rates of that, but seven times four perpetration or becoming a victim of violence once they've been exposed to this trauma of four or more adverse experiences and four times as much for depression. The type of adverse childhood experiences we're talking about is abuse, whether it's physical, emotional, sexual, neglect, whether it's physical or emotional, or whether there are severe household challenges, such as mental illness, intimate partner violence, parental and separation or divorce, incarceration and substance dependence. This all has an impact on the architecture of the brain. So when we're exposed to trauma, what it does is set off the amygdala. That's a part of the brain that acts as an alarm system. Then it goes over to the hippocampus. It's like a search engine, finding where to send it. And then it has an impact on the prefrontal cortex, which causes regulation and executive function. So when we look at the brain and look at the whole system, once the amygdala is affected by these traumatic events, it can go to the cerebellum and cause freezing, just frozen from the impact. Often the, from the amygdala, it goes to the hippocampus and the anterior pituitary, where it affects the adrenal cortex that releases cortisol. And this is where we see either a fight or flight Cortisol is fighting if it goes and releases epinephrine or norepinephrine. Usually it's flight that comes into action. But when the hypothalamus is affected, it can be traumatized. Persons can be redirected to the stimulus going through the posterior pituitary, and we get another hormone release, it's called oxytocin. So the toxic stress that many of our young people and children are going through can potentially change the brain architecture permanently. And it can do this by excessive levels of cortisol 
having an impact on the immune function, having an a pos uh, effect on the whole epigenome of 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 how we're exposed through the environment and actually changing brain anatomy and function. But we have time to intervene. We now realize that the development of the prefrontal cortex continues till when we're in our late 20s. And as we build up more and more white matter, we are able to have that reasoning and control over our emotions and not just going into the fight or flight mechanism. But we have to protect our young people who do not realize and do not have a prefrontal cortex fully formed and in place until in the 20s. So trauma along the way really causes the brain to shut down. It, there's no sense of hope. It's just dealing with the present dan danger. There's no regulation, very impulsive responses seen in the fight or flight. There is no efficacy. They're not controlling the situation. They're just reacting to it. They feel very alone. They're, there's no sense of attachment to anybody that can protect them. And their skill mastery, their learning is shut down. And they're all alone with their threats. So this is why we see these impacts. But I think one of the discussions that I think we should look at today is what can be part of the remedy? And how do we present it? The main thing, if we could prevent it before it occurred um, by targeting the risk factors and strengthening the protective factors and putting people in programs that target the social and economic determinants of violence. That's the best. That's the most effective. But if you do get affected by violence, regardless of what type it is, you can treat each type of violence, whether it's physical, sexual, emotional, neglect, or intimate partner, or self-harm. And then if you the treatment alone doesn't work. You have to go into a phase of rehabilitation. And one of the things is we have to prevent reoccurrence, and then we have to prevent impairment and long-term outcomes. So we have to use evidence-based program, and the later on which we intervene in this trajectory, the more difficult and more, um, more ev more evidence-based programs for a longer period of time have to be made available. But what's the good news is that when we are affected by, by trauma and exposure to violence is that we can def defer and go from the hypothalamus to the pituitary and release this oxytocin hormone. So it's, it's, it is what is released when there is interaction between the caregiver and the child or the adolescent that is meaningful. And um, in some cases, we actually call it grandmother love, that, that child and caregiver and adolescent needs. So when you do have this oxytocin release, you can start pulling together the threads and have the thinking, learning brain working you can have hope, optimism, and faith. You can regulate or self-control activities. You can control yourself, self-efficacy. You are able to form attachments with other people and you feel secure and protected. No need to get involved in, in devious activities or violence. Um, there's, you can learn again. You can develop your skill mastery. And, and you're socially connected to what's going around. So basically what we're talking about is that our young people, our children and adolescents really need this four R's, reassurance of safety, safe places where they can 
always go to. The presence of routine, the presence of regulation, and the presence of strong relationships to help them through this process. One of the things we've come across recently and really have found out that really makes a difference is using drumming, which is very good at pr producing routine and also dealing with post-traumatic stress and anxiety and tension and depression, all of which makes us more vulnerable to get involved in more violence. So we've been doing this um, in drumming circles, and this can also have a huge impact in the restorative justice field and also in reducing um, violence. Sim there are programs that need to be widespread and need to be integrated across. So something like Jamaica Moves, not only is it helping you with physical um, health and wellness, but having a safe, clean, green space with supervised activities definitely engages the youth and keeps them out of crime and violence and gives them an opportunity to excel in different spheres. We found that, you know, you, you even find a benefit when you have peace in society and people can cross borders. So this is a case of Angela Brown, who was able to walk from lower to upper Rosetown, crossing the border, and was able to broker peace. And she reported from, uh, to us that when there's peace in the community, I walk every morning from Rosetown to Emancipation Park. 2.2 miles or 3.6 kilometers, and she feels so much better. But also the impact of peace in the community and the reduction of traumatization of all the children and adolescents, amazing. To do this and to have this working, we have to collaborate, and collaboration is really easy. easy. Thank you. Really look forward to hearing the outcomes of your deliberation. Thank you, Dr. Ward. Very insightful indeed. Trauma that it causes to the brain, particularly for the youth, is definitely what we should pay more attention to when it comes to policy and um, education policy comes to mind, even as we work along other policy areas in terms of security. Uh, Dr. Wendell Wallace is our last speaker for this evening, for this morning session. Uh, Dr. Wallace is a criminologist who lectures in criminology and criminal justice at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. He is also a qualified attorney at law in Trinidad and Tobago, England and Wales, and a practicing mediator with the Mediation Board of Trinidad and Tobago. His research focuses on uh, policing, domestic and, uh, sorry, school violence and gangs. He is the author, editor of some six books and over 30 articles, and is a recipient of two international awards for his research. In 2021, Dr. Wendell delivered a keynote address at the inaugural lecture series Police Research Group, hosted by the UE St. Augustine. And in June this year, he delivered a keynote address at Oxford University, England, on the state of Anglophone criminology. Dr. Wallace is currently working in on the Palgrave Handbook of uh, Caribbean Criminology. Today, Dr. Wallace invites us to contemplate on gun violence, gun homicide, and justice systems in Trinidad and Tobago. What is to be done? Dr. Wallace. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to the uh, members of the audience and to my esteemed fellow panelists, Drs. Uh, Pitt and St. Bernard, as well as I think uh, Prof. Katz would have mentioned that book, mentioned this book. So this is just to give you a visual of that, of this book. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so we have the visual here. Um, additionally, 
um, Professor Katz, um, Dr. Pitts, and Dr. St. Bernard are uh, contributors to the forthcoming Palgrave Handbook of Caribbean Criminology, and I want to publicly thank them. So we'll be looking at gun violence, gun homicide, and the justice systems, and what can be done. But first, let me take you through the global context of gun violence, and then I'll take you through the context of gun violence in Trinidad and Tobago. Instructively, I'll be using some of the work and some of the, 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 the thoughts and ideas mentioned by Professor Katz. Uh, so gun violence, gun homicide, it, it's a sort of destructive problem. It's a global problem. Um, you have a large number of deaths and injuries every year. And as my colleague, Dr. Adams mentioned, it's a complex problem and you need, um, you cannot use a unidimensional approach to solving that problem or minimizing the problem. Indeed, a multifaceted approach using evidence-based approaches is needed. So if you look at some of the, the, the data, you'll realize that between 1998 and 2008, gun-related homicides in Trinidad and Tobago increased by almost 1,000%. And as Prof. Katz alluded to, um, weapons of choice happens to be guns. Again, Prof. Katz and Maguire mentioned that homicides in the island primarily involve um, male offenders and male victims. And I'll show you some data to highlight just that. In terms of gun violence in Trinidad and Tobago, we have a host of drive-by shootings, homicides, robberies, kidnappings, suicides, etc. And you know, if you were to pay attention to what has been happening in Tobago within the past three days, you will realize that there's been three murders in three days, and they've all been conducted using firearms, using a, a gun. In terms of the data, between 2010 and 2016, over 2,000 persons have lost their lives um, to homicides by firearms. 5% uh, of those individuals uh, were females and 95% were males. And it's quite instructive to note that when Professor Gale spoke about the Jamaican situation, approximately 90% of the homicide victims were are male. So you're seeing a similar situation in Trinidad and Tobago. It's also instructive to note that just recently, the Acting Commissioner of Police in Trinidad and Tobago mentioned that within the last 10 years, over 7,000 firearms were seized, and that 87% of all murders committed in the last 10 years were committed using firearms. On this note, we must, um, I must point out that there's no Anglophone Caribbean country that manufactures firearms, yet we have this high percent of firearms being seized and 90 and 95 percent of all homicides being conducted using firearms. And that begs the question, um, are we suffering from a gun violence crisis as it relates to Trinidad and Tobago? Now, I'm going to use some data here to show you homicides by weapon type. And this line represents homicides using firearms. Importantly, Professor Katz mentioned the year 2000 and that there was a takeoff, right? And if you look at the year 2000 onwards, you will see a general increase in homicides using firearms, right? When you look at murders committed using firearms by police divisions in Trinidad and Tobago, from 2010 to 2016, again, using data from the Crime and Problem Analysis a branch of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. One of my colleagues mentioned, I think it was uh, Dr. St. Bernard mentioned, the high rate of uh, murders using firearms in the Port of Spain Division and in Northern Police Division. And over this period, 2010 to 2016, you're seeing that Tobago um, is at the bottom of the, the, the list here with only 13 murders, which averages probably um, one uh, slightly higher than one murder using firearms um, per year. But as I mentioned earlier, just last week, we had three murders um, in three days and they were all committed using firearms in the Tobago Police Division. 
So if we were to use some conjecture here, we, can, we will suggest that the numbers for Tobago Police Division will certainly increase, right? So it's 593 murders committed using firearms uh, in the Port of Spain Division. And you can see the data here indicating the other numbers for the rest of the police divisions throughout Trinidad and Tobago. As it relates to gun-related murders by gender, over 2,000 males would have lost their lives uh, via firearms and just over um, 100 females. And again, as one of my colleagues alluded to, um, or several colleagues alluded to, males seem to bear the brunt of the attacks by uh, firearms and tend to lose their lives. So the question we ask, or the other question we ask, is what can be done? So we've already asked that question as to whether we have a gun violence crisis in Trinidad and Tobago. And the next question, a quite important question, is what can we do? Because we don't only want to highlight these problems, we want to at least look for some solutions. Uh, so some of the things that the, the justice system, uh, they can do, they, they quite a lot. But I just want to highlight some comments that have been made recently in terms of asking that question, what can we do? So Acting Commissioner Police Jacob mentioned, you know, he laments that gun culture in Trinidad and Tobago. A former commissioner, Gary Griffith, met, asked the parliamentarian saying that we want no bail. Um, Griffith also called for judicial officers of the courts to deal with uh, firearm offenders in a more serious manner. So what can be done? We need a multifaceted approach. A unidimensional approach will not work. And the justice system can either use a prevention approach or an intervention approach, or they can use a combination of both. So some of the strategies that can be used to reduce gun violence and gun homicides is to use, for example, gun amnesties. Unfortunately, gun amnesties tend not to work for criminals because for the criminal, that's their tool of trade. Our establishment of gun courts, we've had that in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and that in itself, the research has shown that this tends to work in that you are able to process these criminals in a, a faster manner. Legislation, uh, former Commissioner of Police Gary Griffith wanted no bail for persons charged with um, firearm offenses. But unless we were to amend the legislation, then that would be a sticking point. Indeed, in Trinidad and Tobago today, there's some discretion uh, afforded to judges in that even persons who are charged for murder can receive bail. Right? So this will be a sticking point. In the USA, you have three strikes and you're out legislation, mean that, you know, meaning that you can have um, up to two offenses for um, gun violence or possession of firearms, and then you will be denied bail. But again, the research has shown that this tends to work, but there's some disproportionality in that it tends to affect a particular minority. Um, Professor Katz spoke about reducing the, the market factors, and this is quite important. Uh, you know, Prof. Katz mentioned, spoke about the availability of guns. I think he mentioned is it's about 30% uh, when compared to about 20% in the USA when comparing juveniles, right? We must also have uh, enhanced reporting mechanisms and protection for witnesses in gun-related crimes. Again, this in itself is a sticking point for us in Trinidad and Tobago. We can use focused deterrence, we can use outreach activities, public education campaigns, we can also use intervention strategies. Um, awareness campaigns, we need to use some awareness campaigns so that both juveniles and adults can be aware of the dangers of using firearms um, and you know, the, the antecedents or, or the subsequent um, hurt and harm that it causes to all persons in Trinidad and Tobago as well as the wider Caribbean. One of the weaknesses that we have in Trinidad and Tobago, and you know, uh, my colleague Dr. Pitt spoke about that, is that we have porous borders, and you know, we need to enhance our border protection. Uh, yes, I, 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 I am aware that my time is limited, probably one minute, but yes, we need to enhance our border protection. At one point in time, we had the. I think it was back in the 80s and 90s. We had the Trinidad and Tobago Marine Branch. I know that we have a new but downscale version of that. Uh, and, and we really need to protect our borders, right? Um, from a governmental perspective, the government can, you know, get into more anti-violence 
uh, anti-gun violence approaches by building anti-violence infrastructures, developing effective um, programs and interventions. Uh, and these would include um, you know, more fund, more funding, more resources being pumped into these areas where you have um, gun violence or, or to enhance that gun violence strategy. And we want to teach people in terms of the awareness programs, if we use a, a mediated approach, you know, let people know that we do not have to always uh, resolve conflicts using firearms. So I know that I went a bit quickly, but we were out of time and I'm trying to assist the chair here, but this is the end of my presentation. I'd like to thank you very much, thank the, the coordinators, thank uh, my fellow presenters and to thank the, uh, the participants, those persons who are present. Thank you to the audience for being here. My contact information is here and I can be reached at this information. So thank you and over to the chair. Thank you, Dr. Wallace, and indeed, your presentation was um, well fitted for the end because you did in fact produce us with more solutions to these existing problems associated with gun violence and homicide in our region. Uh, time is against us folks. Um, I want to go right into the panel discussion session uh, segment of our proceedings this morning. Um, just a reminder, we are going to uh, read off the questions from the chat and each presenter, each panelist rather, you can give perhaps a minute or two of a response because of the time limit. Um, and for those who have specific questions dedicated to you or, or um, sent to you, you can take the question in, you can take the question first, of course. And if, if anyone else would like to jump in, please do feel, feel free to do so. Uh, we had a number of questions and quite a few interesting comments as well in the chat. So I'll start with the first question that was posed to the, the panel. And it comes from John Latchman. John asks, what accounts for the plateau after the spike in, 19, in the 1989s? And this was direct, and this is directed to Dr. Gale. Sorry, could you could you go again, please? Thank you. Sorry, um, the question is based on your statistics, your data that you presented. Right. So, Joan Lachman asks, what accounts for the plateau after the spike in in nineteen eighty nine in nineteen eighty nine? Oh, uh, that was that was political. Sorry, let me put my video on. Thank you. That was political. Uh, we had if you if I go back to to this very quickly, what happened is that if you look at the Tivoli incursion, uh, so whenever there is a massive suppression, uh, what happens is that after that, you're gonna get a trench. But the problem in the Caribbean is that after a bout of suppression, nothing is done in terms of addressing ontological security and therefore uh, the, the transition of homicide goes back to its normal curve. So wherever you see a trend, wherever you see a trench in any LAC country, it's either because of uh, suppression, as in extremely heavy manosupadural level suppression, or like the Tivoli incursion, or you see a change in politics, and those things will cause those trench. But then it goes back because normally governments are not doing any of the things that address the root causes of violence. Any other? I, sorry, sorry. I would appreciate if there's any other question because I have to leave in four and a half minutes. Noted, Dr. Gale. Right. Uh, I don't see another question um, dedicated specifically to you, but there are general questions that you can uh, go ahead and answer uh, as they come along. All right. The next. Question, we have quite a few comments, but I won't uh, address the comments given the time frame that we have. So I will just go straight into the question. Next question we have comes from uh, Tracy Bunce, who asks, what year or period, and this is for uh, Dr. Katz, what year or period is the data used for the comparative uh, US versus uh, Trinidad and Tobago data that you would have presented? 
Yeah, I would have to go back and look at that. Um, it's been a while since I looked at it, but I want to say that it was in the late 2000s, uh, and that was the same way with uh, the data from the United States. Right. Thank you. I hope that answers the question. And John Latch asks, uh, makes a comment and then asks a question. The percentages associated with the children, this is from Dr. Katz as well, is, is their perception, uh, she notes, but as yet, no real data. Is that correct? When you say no real, uh, I guess I'm, a, I'm not sure I understand the question, but... Uh... Um, you know, there were questions on whether or not they were actually carrying a weapon to school or carrying a weapon to the community. And it was it was fairly high when compared to Arizona. We there's been data collected out of Europe as well that we would want to compare this to. Uh, and part, part of the issue isn't whether or not youth are going to carry a weapon or carry a gun. Uh, I don't know if we're ever going to get down to zero right in, in some nations. Uh, certainly not in the United States for a long period of time. But I think the question is is one of relativity and whether or not uh, there's a disproportionate amount of gun carrying. And what I didn't get into here is why they are carrying those guns or the reasons that they're professing to it. Uh, and I took those slides out just because there obviously isn't enough time. But the number one reason why youth carry a gun is purely for protection. Uh, fear of victimization from whether it be other groups, other individuals. Uh, we see that in communities where there are less, uh, where there's less formal social control. We have less ability to catch uh, uh, offenders. We have less ability to identify and apprehend individuals with guns. And so one is there's more of that activity. And so people feel the need to carry a weapon to, to, to uh, uh, protect themselves. But what what we have not had time to get into is what is the reason for the fact that they need to protect themselves? We know from the prior literature, one of the biggest reasons, one of the biggest uh, 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 correlates of, of victimization is offending, right? That, that today's victims are tomorrow's offenders. Uh, and so we really need to unpack these issues in the Caribbean to have a better understanding of why youth are carrying firearms at a high rate, uh, especially in a number of, of nations where it's illegal to, to possess a firearm uh, in, unless certain conditions are met. Um, and we need to unpack these issues to be able to address some of those concerns and to be able to mitigate um, uh, fear of victimization uh, in the hopes that it will um, reduce gun carrying, which in turn should reduce further victimization. Thank you. Would any other presenter like to offer a comment? All right. Uh, let me just, these are my final words. <laughs> it's it, it's in, uh, thanks everyone uh, for today. Uh, but uh, I'm, Hosh, I'm trying to juggle class and toward the international lectures. Uh, the, the, the issue about students carrying guns at I'm the chairman of Children First, and we've been working with street children and children who've been in trouble for the last 25 years. And one of the things that is clear is that uh, gun carrying is not simplistic at all. Uh, what, what, if you look at the top five factors as to why kids would carry a weapon to school, the number one is whether or not they are a member of a criminal family. So there are, there are three generation families uh, in Jamaica, Trinidad and, and Belize where I do the bulk of my work, uh, where you know your grandfather was a gunman, father was a gunman and so forth. Uh, th those kids rely on that because of prior knowledge because that's what they know, that's their cultural reference point. The second reason has to do with whether or not you live in, in, a, in a zone, in a corner, uh, people use that word loosely where uh, it is part of of your identity and your protection and your sense of self the third one is how much value girls place on uh maybe a shocker to some uh on a male having a gun in terms of protecting her so uh so so girls first uh siblings and also mothers uh requiring that their that their boys be able to protect uh their families now we call it soldierism because when you speak to dons they tell you very quickly that they're that the boys they work with are soldiers and they will tell you that these boys are protecting everybody and not just themselves and then 
the big one for me is number four, which takes on a whole range of other things, but I'll stop there because of time, is whether or not that child, uh, when, you, when you give him an ontological security index, if he responds anything above 40%, he will not carry a gun. If he feels shielded, if he feels that his family members and everybody are looking out for, for them, including myself growing up in Savile Lamar, where everybody says, Ex excuse me, I load a nerd to go through, uh, someone like myself would never, ever carry a gun. There's nobody, in, none of the, the kids that a community determine is a nerd who's going to become a doctor to help them when they get gunshots or a lawyer to protect them or help them when they go to court later. None of, the, of those children that communities invest in are going to, that we call shielded in, in the frame I gave you, are going to be carrier guns a gun. The low violence ones are only going to have a 2% carrying a gun. But as you move up, by the time it gets to the high risk ones, you're seeing over 70% of them either being attracted to a weapon or carrying a weapon. So in other words, the, it, you have to look at, in fact, we've seen over, I think, 15 different factors that come to bear on, a, on what we call a matrix as to why children carry guns. I have to go, though, take care of yourselves. And it was nice inviting me. God bless. Thank you so much. Right. Um, next question to the panel. Navin Dukaram asks, can someone, can someone comment on the mechanism by which gun violence and gang activity is spatially distributed? Are they restricted to specific communities with hard delineations around tooths? Mm -hmm. Or do they spill over and evolve spatially in an epidemic sense? How can we go about modeling this spatiotemporal distribution? Do we have the data to undertake this analysis? Uh, who asked that question? <laughs> uh, Navin Dukaram asked that question. Well, it's a, it, it is a fantastic question. Uh, and, and thank you for that. I'll give my, my two cents worth. I'm sure the other panelists have much more to add. Um, but we do have a vague understanding of those issues in Trinidad, some work that was conducted uh, by Ed McGuire. Uh, looking at homicide and gangs and, and turf, and we we understand that there is a strong association between uh, turf territory or at least geographic correlates and homicide and, and gang-related homicide. Uh, we do not have so much information when it comes to the rest of the Caribbean. And quite frankly, even in Trinidad, there's only been a, a I, I'm unaware of more than one or two pieces on the issue. Um, I think that that much more work needs to be done in that area, certainly in other communities where there's anecdotal evidence that suggests that that's the case, but no uh, empirical evidence. Uh, we're trying to move forward uh, on those issues, uh, but one of the things that that is complicated is mapping gang territory, which is not an easy task. There's been about a half a dozen really solid peer-reviewed articles on how one can go about doing that. Uh, but the other issue is uh, collecting uh, at least administrative data or homicide data with uh, the right the right geographic data attached to it uh, and whether or not the offense was gang related, which is a whole other issue. And so we need some very specific information on the homicides, which homicides are gang related, uh, the location of the homicide to fairly precise terms, um, whether or not the, the victim or the suspect involved in the offense uh, were involved in a gang. Uh, and then their territory. So it's a lot of specific information that most nations don't have the capacity to collect unless it's a very purposeful effort. Thank you, Professor Katz. Uh, please feel free to make your contribution, the rest of the panelists, that is. Well, I, I, if I can say a few things. Um, with respect to that question, it's a very interesting, a very good question. And it's a question I've always, you know, thought of in terms of how can we obtain the kind of data. And I would think notwithstanding some of the work that I have seen, I have, I remember reading materials from Randy Sipasad talking about the distribution of gangs in a particular at a particular point in time. 
but I would think um, we need to perhaps treat the gang as a unit of analysis and how we go about, you know, understanding the dynamics associated with gang formation and gang membership would involve a research process, which in many ways, many persons may deem to be dangerous research and dangerous research in so far as someone has to go in there and collect the data and to the extent that the data that are collected can be deemed um, valid to the extent that the data collected can be deemed to be authentic um, dependent on whether one is collecting quantitative qualitative data these are issues that i think still cloud at the end of the day you know the value to be derived from the data that are going to be collected and its relevance in terms of um, policy and problem solving so i think there are some challenges and perhaps what we need to do is perhaps embark upon some sort of a methodological engagement even before you know we begin to um, make those kinds of um, prescriptions about how the data can be collected. That's my thank you. If there are no contri other contributors. We'll move on to the next question. Uh, Joan Latchman asks, particularly to Dr. Adams, um, do we know why the communities allow the gangs to start and then become so entrenched? Thank you. So from the people that we interviewed, um, some uh, young people indicated that uh, this is a war that they actually um, were born into. So the wars have, within their communities have been going on for decades. And this is a war that they think will continue after they die. So a lot of young people actually grew up with this. And um, they've also been intimately impacted by the gun violence and the gang violence, right? So people mentioned loved ones and friends that they lost to the war. And so it's very personal for them. It's very painful with we're thinking about um, why this continues. And when it comes to um, why do communities uh, allow the gangs to become so entrenched, I think that's a very, comp it's a good question and it's very complicated as well. Um, so it's true that uh, gangs attract a lot of violence to the communities, right? There are a lot of shootouts uh, within the communities, but it also appears that the community members are conflicted about the presence of gangs. So they know that there is danger within their areas, but in a sense, the gangs also sometimes provide a sense of security and safety for people within the neighborhood. So for example, um, the gang that's in control of the area that you live in may protect you and your your people within your community from getting victimized by other gangs that would come into the area. So they sort of pre present a barrier between you and the other gangs. Uh, in some communities, residents noted that um, gang members have a they make a sense of have a sense of law within the community, right? So they would ban the commission of certain crimes within their community, and they would even punish people who go against what they say in their area. When we did some ethnographic observations, we actually observed young people within select communities who appear to be on guard, right? So they were like stationed in a place where they could pay close attention to who was entering and entering their neighborhood. So uh, in this sense, gangs provide a sense of security to some communities, they attract violence, but they also provide employment opportunities, right? And so it's because of this complexity that uh, community members have um, actually uh, started coexisting with gangs. It's, uh, it's difficult for the people who are living within these communities, but it's a very complex uh, reality for them as well. Thank you. It's just, just to build on what Dr. Adams said, many of the, the, the persons in some of the areas that are highly penetrated by gangs, especially in the East Port of Spain area, uh, the, the, the gangs are allowed to perpetrate because one, these communities tend to be transient and there's no um, real attachment to those communities. Um, as Dr. Adams said, 
it, it's a complex situation as well. And, and no one uh, perspective is stronger than the other as to why people allow the gangs to perpetrate. In fact, in uh, specific communities in the East Port of Spain area, gangs continue uh, because, in fact, the people do not understand how gangs were formed in the first place. So they continue to perpetrate these, these, these little territorial wars. Um, and, you know, I quote Halgraves, we see Halgraves here, because they are unaware as to why the gangs were created. In fact, when the history of the research, the history of gangs in those areas actually showed that um, a lot of the gangs are uh, tied to, or the creation were tied to the early beginnings whereby people moved from different Caribbean areas and they formed these little areas. So Ethan Quarry was Vincentian, um, Picton was Grenadian, so they, they have these little territories and the aim was to keep people out. And that has transcended into today. Uh, someone mentioned earlier about these turfs where you can't go into one uh, community because you reside on the other side of the community. It's a, it's a sort of interesting dy dynamics looking at gang creation uh, in these communities from a historical perspective. And you know, I want to put, um, some research that I had conducted, I've placed it in the chat there, uh, because if we understand the evolution of these gangs, then we'll be able to understand how they operate in the contemporary era. Thank you, uh, both Dr. Adams and Dr. W uh, Dr. Wallace. As we move ahead to the next question, Sable Best asks, uh, regarding ethnicity and gun use, Dr. Sin Bernard's statistics indicated a much higher percentage of African males than, than East Indian males using guns. From readings and lectures, marginalized communities are mentioned, and the males from these communities are unfortunately drawn into the life of guns. Is it that these marginalized communities mostly consist of African males? Or is it that African males lack internalized norms and values, which would have been instilled from their families, peers, and communities? <laughs> Interesting question. Uh, I'll take that question, then I do have to depart for uh, another uh, presentation. But uh, uh, we just uh, finished uh, some work in Nine Nations uh, examining um, uh, that is one of the sub questions. And we did find that in uh, about half of the nation, half of the nations, uh, Afro Caribbeans were more likely to be engaged in violence, uh, particularly with, with firearms, but not in all of the Caribbean nations. Uh, so we do know that there are some differences between nations. Uh, it certainly existed in uh, Guyana and Trinidad, um, uh, I believe. Um, don't recall which which of the other nations, but as far as what the causes are, we certainly don't know. We, we do think that there's a correlation there, but we, we don't know what the what the what the root cause might be might be. If I can add just in, in with respect to the fact that the question was directed to some extent to a statement I would have made, I did not none of my data makes any connection between the use of firearms by persons of African descent. It's more, it speaks, my data speak more to victims being predominantly of African descent. So that's the first thing that I want to correct. Secondly, with respect to the, um, the causes, I, I do not want to venture into any um, statement that reflects family values because I do not have the evidence to support it from my research or any other research. What I can perhaps say is that again, and it may really have something to do with uh, an association I, that, that was established based on the data I presented showing in, you know, in terms of, you know, probable cause, uh, probable cause and, 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 and gun violence, um, fatality due to gun violence, um, I would think, you know, 
where there are gangs, where there are reprisals as a result of gang related activity, where there is some connection to drugs and drug trafficking and drug related drug related activities, where there are robberies, I think, you know, most of these uh, activities, especially the first three take place in communities that are predominantly um, Afro based communities. And because of that association, that may to some extent, you know, explain what is being observed. I also think there has to be um, some connection between, you know, family sociology and the experiences within um, families according to the ethnic origin of family members and headship within families. I don't think in a Trinidad and Tobago um, context. Um, I remember doing a study of family life in the Caribbean back in, I think it was in, in 1995. <laughs> 1995, we are 2025, will be 30 years. And um, I don't think any study like that has been done since. And I think if we are doing such a study, we need to be able to um, emphasize the importance of, you know, family living and family arrangements and family dynamics and outcomes within family settings. And I don't think it should be a cross-sectional study either. There should be some way and means of establishing and obtaining data retrospectively. I think these are important connections that we have to make if we have to really begin to have the evidence that can link, you know, um, contextually familial arrangements and familial dynamics to the kinds of outcomes that we just, you know, make flippant statements about without having the evidence to support, you know, what is actually happening. So I think this is yet another call for the authorities to think seriously about doing work on and, and facilitating some serious exercises, exercises in terms of understanding the family sociology that prevails in Trinidad and Tobago, which is absent. And I think a lot of the answers we are looking for could perhaps be found inside of that. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. St. Bernard. Did another panelist wish to comment? All right, we'll move swiftly to the other question posed by Karen Julian. Karen asks, I'm quite interested in learning what were the catalysts of 2000 that appear to perpetuate this growth in gun violence in Trinidad and Tobago? Oh. Well, I want to address that question, Madam Chair, by saying that Professor Katz might have been the best person to answer that question. I'm not really deflecting, right? But Prof Katz um, has done a lot of the work and we simply use the data. But, you know, indeed, you know, the data shows that from 2000 onwards, you had that spike in, in guns and gun homicide. So he might have been the best person to answer that question. I'm really not in a position to proffer um, a response beyond that. So my apologies, Karen. All right, good question though, Karen. Um, unfortunately, uh, given time, and there's so many other questions, very good questions in the chat uh, that we did not get a chance to address. Um, perhaps a next section and a next segment on this particular issue is needed. We would like to uh, ask the panels, the panelists to give their closing remarks before we go, before we proceed with the next segment of the program. So thank you again for your, uh, your questions and comments, audience, and we would like to pass on to the panelists for your final word. Okay, well, if I may, um, Madam Chair, as I have another meeting at 12.30 p.m., I just want to point out that gun violence, uh, gun homicides, um, it's a pervasive issue and there's um, a multifaceted um, amount of reasons and rationales behind the use of, of firearms. And in some instances, we have to disaggregate that data. For example, if you look at Guyana in some recent work that we've done in Guyana um, on domestic violence, 
you realize that sharp objects are still the choice of weapons for homicides in Guyana. Um, so while we may categorize homicides broadly, sometimes we need to disaggregate it to see um, what type of homicides and what are the weapons of choice there. But as Dr. Adams mentioned, it's a multifaceted approach and we, it's a multifaceted problem, it's a complex problem, and we need to use a multifaceted approach in order to, to, to resolve that issue of guns, gun violence, et cetera. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. Uh, we'll move to Dr. Erica since she's next to Dr. Wallace from my yeah. view. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, just listening to all the amazing presentations today, we see that there is so that's such a like rich research of going on around uh, um, gun violence and gang violence in the Caribbean, and there were so many connections between what the presenters were saying. So I think in closing, I would just say that evidence-based practices researchers working with governmental officials um, and law enforcement to develop strategies to address specific communities and the problems that they're encountering would be something that's very important. So thank you so much for having me today. Okay, and Adam. If, I, if I can add my bit, I have to admit, you know, I am a demographer first and foremost, but I think as a demographer, there is a contribution that demography and the science that is demography can make to understanding you know criminological outcomes such as um criminal homicide and it is from that lens that i want to make this comment because i think the question posed by karen was a very important question what are the, what were the antecedents that really provoked that spike that we saw, we saw, uh, or we have seen since 2000. And clearly it's generational. And this is the kind of, you know, issue that interests demographers. And one of the things I, f I find with respect to a lot of policy relevant research that we do, including that which deals with criminological outcomes, is that we focus on period data. And I dare say all of the data that we have looked at in terms of the quantitative time series data are period data. What happens at a particular point in time? What happens in a particular period? But what is even more important is doing the cohort studies in terms of the population groups that actually were of a particular age in a particular period and what they were experiencing and how those experiences dovetail with the outcomes at some point in time in the future. And we haven't been doing that kind of research because it really calls for a kind of sophisticated research design that many of us perhaps have not been sufficiently well tra trained in. And I think, you know, to answer the question that Karen has posed, it really called for a much more sophisticated kind of data collection. Certainly many Caribbean countries are poor when it comes to access to official statistics within their respective national statistical systems. We have to correct that because we can't be seeking answers and we have rotten statistical data with all due respect to our national statistical offices that really try their best to deliver the best that they could. But what our national statistical offices can do is really a reflection of the kind of support they get from their governments first and foremost, and the people who are supposed to supply the data. So I think, you know, if we are to address the kind of question that, you know, Karen is, 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 is asking, these are the kinds of requirements that we need to put in place to provide the re relevant answers. And I think that's my bit. And I'm really thankful that we had this session this morning and for all the presentations and all the comments and all of the questions. I think um, they were really rich contributions and I look forward to you know whatever contribution we can all make collectively. And I hope that the authorities that be would really see the importance of you know what we as academics whether in trinidad and tobago jamaica wherever else in the caribbean and also our colleagues overseas what contribution we can make in terms of helping to address this scourge because this is not a problem and when you listen to people out there they feel you know well we can solve this next year 
this is not a next year problem. The root causes of these problems that we're experiencing today would have started 30, 40 years ago. And I don't want to be the bearer of bad news if we have to ensure that you know we can quell these problems within the next within the short to medium term. We have a lot of work to do ahead of us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. St. Bernard. Yes, indeed. So we've come to the end of uh, this segment. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Is there any other um, panelists I would like to offer up a final word? I think we've completed all panelists. Um, yeah, so we've come to the end of this segment, and we have looked at the historical, ontological, social, political, and in some instances, economic perspectives on this issue and we are left with uh, solutions that need to be had and the solutions of course don't come from just the policy makers they come from parents teachers and even our young ones themselves so there's lots of work to be done uh, and I would like to personally thank the panelists and all who have um, contributed to this particular session but to give the official vote of thanks, I now pass the session over to Ms. Cheryl Floyd, who is going to uh, offer up the official vote of thanks. Thank you again, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to give the vote of thanks on this occasion of the 12th Solicis Virtual Forum on the topic on related violence and criminal homicide in Caribbean society. A uh, warm thank you to our seven panelists for an intense but a much needed and relevant discussion given our current context. Your insight and expertise shared with us has been valuable and it is our hope that it would prompt further discussion, exploration and action in our national landscape. Um, thank you specifically to Dr. Hubert Gale, Professor Charles Katz, Dr. Erica Adams, Dr. Wayne Pitts, Dr. Wendell Wallace, and Dr. Elizabeth Ward, who couldn't be with us here in live, but thank you for her presentation. Thanks to Dr. Saint Godfrey St. Bernard, who continues to be a champion for the call for data-driven approaches and continuing to drive these issues to the forefront, um, also via forums like these. Our dedicate thanks, especially to our dedicated solicit staff, Ms. Katian Modest, Mrs. Sheldon Warner, and also our campus IT services, Ms. Josanne Green of the Marketing and Communication Department at UV St. Augustine. And thank you um, to our participants for your time and your valued engagement and excellent contributions um, via the chat. Um, hopefully in future we can be able to have these conversations um, in person. Um, for all involved, it's important for all of us as a community with shared interest in addressing the burden of gun violence to establish a culture of using data-driven approaches to identify root causes, drive solutions and interventions. Um, so thank you again um, for your time and hopefully we can see the outcome of your future work um, in your respective fields. Um, lastly, um, but not least, um, I'll thank the chair of the forum, Ms. Alicia Shepard, um, for hosting us this evening. Um, and thank you, thank you all again. So hope to see you all soon in um, a subsequent forum. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cheryl. Uh, now that we have brought the curtain down on our segments, um, I would like to say thank you as well to everyone, Ms. Cheryl included, for her vote of thanks. And just leave one reflection, one point for reflection. Now that all reflections based on the topic at hand um, have been given a voice, what other actions can we now take to ameliorate the impact of gun-related violence and criminal homicide in our own societies, our own communities, particularly in the case of the most for the most vulnerable in our societies. I hope we run with this and all of us contribute to this increasing, increasingly um, problematic issue within our societies. I would like to pass the floor to Dr. Sin Bernard, Acting Director of Solicis, for closing remarks. 
Dr. St. Bernard. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair, for leading us through this wonderful session. And thank you to Ms. Floyd for her vote of thanks. I just want to make two quick remarks, and they have to do with some upcoming Salesis sessions. Um, on the 14th of October, Salesis will be hosting another one of its virtual forums looking specifically at issues arising out of the Trinidad and Tobago budget statement that was read on Monday. And as usual, our focus is more or less taking uh, the position of an institute that is focused on development issues and promoting progressive development agendas. And how does the budget really facilitate this from the standpoint of various scholarly perspective. So we already have in train a vibrant and quite um, interesting and impressive panel to really address these issues. That will be on the 14th of October. And between the 19th to the 21st of October, Salesis will be spearheading what is referred to as the UE TMU um, RCYP conference. RCYP stands for the Rights of Children and Youth Partnership. Um, basically, the, uh, the, the UETMU conference, TMU stands for Toronto Metropolitan University, which was formerly Ryerson University. And UE is collaborating with Ryerson University to host a conference on the rights and well being of children and young people in the Caribbean, Central America, and the their respective diaspora populations in Canada. And we will have about, I, I would imagine we will have as many as about 40 to 50 papers being presented in a bilingual conference because there will be presentations from Central America, presentations from in the Caribbean, and so on. And there will be a particular feature, um, some are uh, more or less um, showcasing the contribution of Dr. Elaine Arnold who is a who was who is a formidable um, contributor to child research within the region and especially with Caribbean populations in England. So I just thought I should inform you of these events that are upcoming that will be um, spearheaded by Salesis Saint Augustine, and as usual, Salesis whether it's in Saint Augustine, Mona, or Keville. We continue to blaze the trail with respect to ensuring that you know the region and the global south and in some instances international areas are really um, the point of points of focus in terms of the work we do that is geared toward advancing development agendas. So I just thought I should make these quick remarks and thank you very much everyone who participated. We appreciate your presence and do enjoy the rest of your day. And of course, blessings to all of you as we move on in life. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Have a great rest of the day and be safe.